good Lord, body cameras. I think everybody on this board already agrees that body cameras are a necessity. Okay, it's, y'all are sitting here addressing the sheriff and sheriff issues. Um, don't wanna to delve too much into it, but that, that'll be up to y'all to handle on voting season. Okay, if you don't like what's going on, then go ahead and make that change. Um, I've, we've all addressed it with the sheriff before, body cameras. Um, besides cutting funding to the sheriff department, which actually hurts the department, you know, and that's not something that we want to do. There's really not much we can do. He's an elected official. Okay. Um, do we want certain changes? Yes, but we are not the sheriff to make those decisions. Um, but I also think, like I said, I think there should be an answer period in order to speak to the individuals and constituents just so we can actually get some of this off the slate once it's brought up. So keep doing what y'all are doing because it matters up there at that podium. It really does. So thank you. February 7th, 2022, and today is um, March 16th, 2022. I mean, Matthew Nicole, the Hunter County Commissioner, Matt Nicole, he gave, you know, nothing but excuses um, for um, the board's inaction on multiple issues, on lots of issues, but I only, I'm only focused on the body cameras. That's why I only showed the part where he discussed body cameras, but he gave a whole speech before that where he gave a multitude of of excuses after excuses after excuses as to why the Board of Harnick of Commissioners is not getting anything done. Um, but specifically, I just wanted to focus on body cameras only here. Um, because my wife and I, you know, we are living, breathing proof of why they need body cameras. You know, all they have to do is threaten to withhold the budget. They, you know, and it, it would force Wayne Coates to get the body cameras like multiple other cities and counties across the United States have done. I mean, they wouldn't actually be taking any money away from them. You know, in fact, they would be giving the sheriff's office more money for body cameras and other things as well, possibly. They'd be getting more money because not having body cameras, it hurts the entire community, including the sheriff's office. Now, when I spoke with Mr. Nicole, uh, this is a recorded conversation that I had with him that I'm playing here. You know, I liked Mr. Nicole when I spoke with him. I mean... But I'm sorry, but he's proving this, the entire board of Harnett County Commissioners to be spineless, including Ms. Nicole, including Ms. McCoy, you know, who's the only Democrat on the board. So we need to vote out all these commissioners as well. I mean, they're, because their hands are not tied. And they don't seem to care about saving any lives, and people have died because of this issue. John Livingston is a good example. Okay, one of many examples. But... Um, you know, all the commissioners on this board need to be voted out, particularly, definitely, Lewis Weatherspoon. That guy's a piece of garbage. He needs to go. Brooks Matthews needs to be voted out. They aren't, um, the, all the, these are all Republicans except for Barbara McCoy, but Barbara McCoy might as well be a Republican. She's no different than any of these other commissioners from what I've seen. From what I've seen of her performance, every single one of them need to be voted out, including Matt Nicole and including Barbara McCoy, I'm sorry to say I know she's the only Democrat on the board, but need to start expecting, you know, more from her. Need to, her need her to, need her constituents need to start expecting her to act like a Democrat on that board, and actually um, start caring about the issues her constituents want. Because she's not in her community, she's totally out of touch with what her constituents want. I know because I'm speaking with them, and they and they tell me. But Matt Nicole here, you know, he gave a lot of excuses.
But in this conversation here, at least he, you know, when he, he thought it was private and he told me what he really thought. So anyway, vote out this entire board because you know, they are part of the problem as well, honestly. Now, this is now, now I'm gonna, what I'm going to get into now is why we need body cameras. Like I said, my wife and I are living, breathing proof of why they need body cameras. This is what happened. This is what happened to my wife. Okay, this is regarding our incident on September 25th, 2014, when my wife and I were violently attacked in our house by corrupt Tarnock County Sheriff's deputies, John C. Knight and Nicholas Kihagis, as well as another deputy named Brandon Klingman. This is what happened to my wife. This is what deputy Nicholas Kihagis did to my wife after I was removed from the house that day. I'll let, you know, this prop gun she's de we're demonstrating with, if you watch this whole testimonial video, this 57 minute testimonial video we did back on January 23rd, um, th that's just a pellet gun and I totally cleared it. I exercised all the safety precautions with it, just so you know up front. I say, why do you move to my husband like that? What did he do know? Then he turned around, one hand he got my husband, I told him. He had my phone in his hand. Yeah. And one hand. One hand, hand, and one hand he got gun in my head. The big, big show, show me how he was pointing the gun at me. Sorry. It's okay, go ahead and just do it. Like this. He had it right up to your head like that. Yeah. Did he actually touch your head with the metal? Yeah. With the barrel? He, so he actually did touch your head. Yeah. Then he said, if you don't touch the fuck, I'm going to kick your ass too. He said, just like that, when he's holding the gun in your foot, in, to your head temple, just like that. Yeah. And what did you say to him exactly? And I said, why? Get, I said, get my, Go ahead. get it to me. What were you asking for? Give me what? My husband iPhone. Okay, so you're asking for my phone back. Yeah. So exactly, what did you say to him and what did he say to you? He said, and he took one gun, he got, one hand he got gun in my head, just like this. Uh -huh. And one hand got my husband iPhone to leave every little thing. And he said, if you don't chop the fuck up, I'm going to kick your ass too. And that was, we, pick up the picture of the deputy, did that? <laughs> Pick up the picture of the, de the deputy, uh, go ahead and pick it up. Show the camera, the deputy who did that to you? Yeah. So this, pull this face right up to the camera. So th this guy right here. Yeah. Deputy Nicholas Kihagis. Yes, Deputy Nicholas Kihagis. What my wife was explaining here after I was taken out of the house. Um, see, when Knight punched me in the face, I, when Knight came in the house, the first thing I did was hold up my phone and hit the record button and then he took his closed fist and he punched me in the face, and I went face down on my living room floor, and I dropped the phone. And, I, and after he, I was taken out of the house, this guy here, Deputy Nicholas Kihagis, picked up my old iPhone 5 at the time, and, de de and right in front of my wife, he deleted the video of the incident. And she's explaining it here, right, right, hon? Yes. And um, see, what happened was that day, I'll briefly explain, and, and for the full details in the story, watch this full... 57-minute-long um, testimonial video here that we did on January 23rd, 2022. That's probably our best one that we've, I've ever done. I've been working at this for quite a while. Um, but that day, the day of the incident, well, let me back up here a little bit. My wife and I had just recently been released from the hospital. My wife had just recently been released from the hospital after um, several months on life support. Let me get to her picture here. See, my wife had just recently been released from the hospital after several months on life, after a few months on life support. Um, we had a, a severe accident in June of 2014 um, when I was in the process of getting out of the military. I was actually coming back from work that day and we had some really horrible weather. I, you know, I know, I mean, I, I still, it still bothers me to this day because I was driving the car, but I mean, there really was not a lot I could do about it in that particular situation just because the weather was blowing in. I might have panicked a little bit because the road was starting to flood. The rain was blowing in hard, so I, I, I hit the gas. I was trying to get out of there, and, and then there was somebody else ahead of me that was stuck in the water, that looked, appeared to be stuck in the flood. And, we, and we, the flood was just so bad that I tried, when I tried to stop the car, we ended up wrecking when I tried to stop because there was somebody else right pulled 
that was stopped right in front of me, stuck in the, and appeared to be stuck in the flood as well. But she was recovering from that at the time when Nicholas Kihagas, this was only a, this picture here was taken, this is when she was finally starting to improve when they took her off the ventilator and she still had the tracheotomy in at this point. But this picture here was only about a month before, about maybe a month or two before um, Deputy Nicholas Kihagas did that to her. Okay, but the day, um, the day before the incident happened on September 25th, 2014, um, my wife had been released from the hospital and I was still taking her to Cape Fear Valley Hospital for her physical, occupational, and speech therapies. And I was on my way out the door one day and a deputy was serving me, served me with some civil process paperwork from Maryland and I was a little rude and I, I kept walking to the car and he served me with it still, but I was just a little rude. And it wasn't really a big deal. I wasn't, it wasn't anything, it wasn't a criminal matter. It was just civil process paperwork and he still served it with me. He served me with it. He put it on my, on the windshield of my car. So he did serve me with it. It was just, um, I was just rude and it wasn't really a big deal. And it was no excuse for how they treated us in return. Okay. For in return at the time I was dealing with TBI as well at the time because I was in that same accident. And this was like my third time sustaining TB, traumatic brain injury. Okay. That ripped open the top of my skull there. My brain was actually exposed. And that was my third, um, I'm a disabled veteran, and that was the third time I sustained TBI. I'm a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. Although this incident here, that was a car accident in the States, though. But I, I, that wasn't my first time sustaining TBI. So, you know, I was still recovering as well. It, you know, it off, you know, and it, you know, the head injury throws you off, okay? I was dealing with a lot at the time, getting out of the military and stuff. So if I was a little rude, well, you know what? That's too bad because that's part of, I'm sorry to say, but that is part of their job. Okay, they, they have to be able to deal with stuff like that, and, and um, if, they can't, if they can't handle somebody that's a little rude, then they need to find a different line of work. But, so he tried to serve me, so he was serving me the civil process paperwork, and then a few days later after that, about a day, or, I think the next day or a day or two later, on September 25th, 2014, I received a letter in the mail from the court in Maryland where that civil process paperwork came from. And it said that it was null and void and I could disregard it. So I called the Harnett County Sheriff's Office non-emergency phone number at 910-893-9111 just to tell them, hey, I got this letter in the mail regarding that civil process paperwork you were serving me with. And it says it's null and void. Do you need a copy of it? Can I please send it to you? Do you have like a, um, I forget what I was, I asked, yeah, I think I was asking at first for like a fax number where I could just fax it to him. But then the dispatcher kept hanging up. And I, I, and I called back, I was like, hey, you know, why are you hanging up? I'm, I'm just, I don't, because I really didn't know if they needed a copy of it or not. I really didn't, because they were the ones serving me with it. So I figured they probably needed a copy of the paperwork from Maryland saying that it was null and void. And you know what? They probably would need a copy of that, just so they know it's not valid anymore. But the dispatch of this kid, it was a, oh, the whole thing was a gaslight, basically. They were messing with me from the minute I called because they were already um, mad at me because I, I had already called the complaint in a few days before that as well about, I mean, when the deputies, there was a few incidents before that, not incidents, but a few times before that where deputies from the Harnett County Sheriff's Office came to the house trying to serve me with the paperwork and I didn't answer the door and they, they would start banging on the door real, real loud outside and I might have called the complaint about that. I called the complaint about that, but... I mean, if they don't like the complaints, if they don't like my complaints or if they don't like what I have to say, well, I mean, that's not harassment. That's, a, that's just calling the sheriff's office about official business, okay? If they don't like it, that's tough. But shortly after that phone call was when the incident happened on September 25th, 2014 that we were describing. Um, when the, dep the deputies first arrived to our house, Deputy John C. Knight, Nicholas Cahagas, and Brandon Klingman, the first thing we heard was just loud noises outside. They were never really knocking. Like in the days prior, when the deputies came to my house trying to serve me with the paperwork, even during the times when I didn't answer the door, they would knock sternly like this. Okay, and I it may have not answered it, but I can tell the difference. And I think that's another reason why they were doing what they were doing, because they were also mad that there was a few days before that, right, when they tried to serve me with the civil process paperwork, that I didn't answer the door. And they were also upset about that. That's why they were another reason why they were doing this. They just were trying to retaliate. It was, all, it was just retaliation is all this was. 
It was not a lawful arrest by any means. Um, so, but there's no law that says you have to answer the door if they don't have a warrant. So it doesn't give them an excuse to do this to us. But then when they came to our house that day, this is what we heard outside. On all, and not just on the doors, but on the doors, the walls, the windows, on all four sides of the house. This is what we could hear. shouting and I heard somebody say we're going to kill you mother effer and stuff like that and then I remember when I, I got up off the couch to go see what was going on and I walked to that side of the house where um, the noise was coming from and the, the first thing I saw in, when I got in the kitchen through the window right through my window outside was Deputy John C. Knight standing there pointing a Glock 9mm at my head. He drew it, he, he was pointing at right at my head to the window with his finger on the trigger. And my hands immediately went up and I said, please don't shoot, this is just a phone in my hand, please don't shoot. And I stood there for a, almost a full minute, I think, or at least several seconds, waiting for him to give me some commands. Like, I was expecting him to say, open the door or something. But he wouldn't let me open the door. He just stood there pointing a gun at me through the window and the door I was going towards was past him. And the only way I could get to the door was to walk past him, pointing that gun at me. And I wasn't going to do that because I didn't know what his intentions were. He was just standing there silently pointing a gun at my head. So I finally after decided I'm not getting shot today. So I ducked and I low crawled back into the living room with my wife. And then they were still outside making the noise. It went on for several minutes. Sometimes it would get, it would get really loud and sometimes it would get quiet. And I couldn't see him at that point. I could only hear him. I could no longer see them. I could only hear them outside shouting at us and cursing at us and making noise. So I kept fumbling between the video and the audio recording on my phone because I, I couldn't see him. So I, the first thing I decided to do was, well, hit the audio record button under voice memos. So I do have part of it recorded. And then when they worked their way around to, uh, when they worked their way around to the, the living room side of the house where we were sitting, and this, is, this was the door they started pounding on next. I think they, they all started to concentrate on this door. We're in, the, in, the, in front of, in, I'm sorry. They all started to concentrate on this door in the living room, where, which was the part of the house that my wife and I were both sitting at that moment. And one second. Okay. Yeah, so um, at, at this part, when, at this, at this part when, during this part of the incident, they started bashing that door the same way I already described, like this. Okay, they weren't trying to get in. They weren't knocking. They weren't. They could have easily kicked it in if they wanted to. But I, I know. I think I know now why they didn't. Because they didn't have a warrant. They never. They never presented me with a warrant. I just assumed they had a warrant because they came in. You know, I didn't think they were allowed to do that without a warrant. And well, they're not. <laughs> but in Harnett County, they do it anyway. Because before this incident happened, I did not have any warrants. I had no criminal charges against me, except for the misdemeanor charge that these, that these deputies made up just to cover for what they did to us out of retaliation. But the door got damaged like you see in the picture here. And as you can see, the date stamp on that is September 26, 2014, the, by about 5.24 p.m. By the next afternoon, I took that picture. By the time I get home from the hospital, the next afternoon, the next day. And I remember I started yelling and please, I started yelling, hey, please stop, because they were so loud, I, I couldn't, the reason why I started yelling because they were so loud outside, I, had, I needed them to hear me. And I was like, please stop, please stop, I'm gonna open the door for you, I'm gonna open it. But I couldn't open it because they were bashing it so hard. That's how the door frame got damaged like that. But as you can see, the lock is still intact because I unlocked it for them. I mean, I remember they kept bashing it so hard, I couldn't open it. So I finally leaned in the door a little bit and I unlatched that top lock and turned the door handle, and that's when Deputy John C. Knight came storming in first, and the first thing I did was I held up my iPhone 5, and I hit the record button. That's all I did. Okay, I had a T I, had, I was recovering from TBI at the time, and it, and, it does, and it did cause confusion and stuff, but I mean, I clearly, my wife and I both saw it, and we both very clearly remember everything that happened. So you're not that kind of confusion, but... When Deputy Knight walked in, the first thing he did, he took his closed fist and he punched me in the face. And I went face down to my living room floor and then they proceeded to start kicking me, stomping on me. 
and they zapped me with dry stun guns. And then when they removed me, from, when, when Knight handcuffed me, he cinched the cuffs down at the, uh, around my wrist, as, my wrists as tight as they would get, cutting off my circulation. And it caused damage. It damaged my wrists for several days after that. And I should have taken the pictures of the marks around my wrists. I think that's the one thing I didn't take a picture of, was the, the, the marks around my wrists. But that's, the, that's what Knight did to me right there. This picture here was taken in the hospital. You, can kind of, you should be able to tell with that, that little rack behind me. That was taken in the hospital. As you can see, the date stamp is, if I can just zero, zero in on that a little closer. Okay, as you can see, the date stamp is September 26, 2014, at 2.25 p.m. That was the next afternoon, because I, by the time I bailed out of jail and got to the hospital, it was the next afternoon, because they, they actually jacked my bail up to $15,000 for a Class two misdemeanor. The, the only charges, they, I didn't have any criminal charges, except for what they made up. They, they called, when I called their office to complain and tell them that the paperwork I received from Maryland was null and void, according to the letter I received, they called that harassing phone calls, even though I was calling for official business, clearly. And so it was just falsified, and they, just falsified, just to cover for what they did to us. And they jacked my bail up to $15,000, but Knight told me in the car exactly why they were going to do that, because he said they were going to make sure I stayed in there for 30 days at least, so I would have time for my bruises to heal before I would have a chance to document it. But I did bail out. They underestimated that I had money saved. And within 24 hours, by the next, by the next, by after midnight that night, before the next, by the next morning, by late that night, after midnight, early the next morning of September 26, 2014, we finally made it to here to Cape Fear, I'm sorry, not Cape Fear, but Duke Hospital. And that picture was, was taken in the hospital there. And they, when I was on the ground, they were also stomping on me. And that's how I got the fractured foot. And you can see that was also taken in the hospital. You see my foot sitting on a gurney. And the date stamp again is September 26, 2014. And the medical records actually document it very thoroughly. These are my medical records from Duke Hospital on September 26, 2014. That's the first page. And here's the second page, which actually documents the injuries. Fracture of great left toe, injury to eye, bruised ribs, I had cracked ribs, and a fractured foot, and, and a black eye. And that, and that documents it right there. That, and you can find all this information posted on my website, and on my YouTube, and on my Facebook group. But the pictures are date stamped, and the medical records document the injuries within 24 hours of the assault. And also on the medical records, if you read closely, it actually does document assault. Right there, assault. And you can see the injuries documented right there in black and white. So, oops, hang on one second. So, that's what happened. And there was, a, there was also additional targeting by Nicholas Kihakis as well. Um, there, there, and as the Zayton Law Firm is well aware of, as you've heard them, if, if you watch some of my other videos, Watch the uh, video I copied from this man here on the left in the blue jacket, and Mr. Robert Zayton, where he talks about what these deputies were known for doing. They are very well aware that they would falsify criminal charges on people all the time just to cover for what they did to, to them. And, and there was multiple other incidents besides ours. According to um, Mr. Robert Zayton, Nicholas Kihagas had over 200 cases where he falsely charged people with resisting arrest. Okay, so we were not the only ones, but, but our case was probably one of the most serious. And this law firm needs to be helping us as well. But there was additional targeting by Kihikis. After that incident, I, I tried to meet with the DA. They wouldn't talk to me. So I actually did meet with Wayne Coates. At the time, he was Captain Wayne Coates. And I met, he was their patrol supervisor. And that was before he was sheriff. Shortly after I met with him, about a year later, I believe he was promoted to major. And then in 2016, after Sheriff Larry Rollins, who was sheriff during our incident, after he resigned in disgrace after the John Livingston murder and after the Brandon Bethay murder video was released, then the Harnett County Board of Commissioners appointed Sheriff Wayne Coates. And then he was elected in 2018. So this is only his first term. So we need to vote for Reggie Watson for Harnett County Sheriff. 
But after I met with Wayne Coates, shortly after that was when Nicholas Kihagas would start parking um, in front of our, he, was, he would park in front of our house and wait for us to leave. Um, actually not in front of our house, but behind our house specifically. Yeah. Was the one, that, um, this guy here, Deputy Nicholas Kihagas. See, um, our previous address was 28 West Side Drive in Cameron, North Carolina, zip code 28326. And maybe if I maybe I should have um, pulled that pulled up that map for this presentation, but you can you can Google that for yourself and you can see what the what it looks like. Okay, behind, in our backyard there were some bushes, and then on the other side of those bushes there was a church. And Nicholas Kihagis would park by that church and wait for us to leave. And on November 11th, 2014, as soon as I, I, that day I was that morning, I was taking my wife to her physical therapy appointment at Cape Fear Hospital. And I pulled out into Highway 24 and took a left heading towards um, 87 South, heading in towards Spring Lake to, to get to Cape Fear Valley Hospital. And Deputy Nicholas Kihagas immediately pulled out and got right on my bumper and started following us within inches of my bumper. Whenever I would switch lanes, he would switch lanes with me. And this went on for several miles down the road. He was terrorizing us on the road. And as we started to get closer to Cumberland County on Highway 87 South, he, he, I think it was because he knew I was almost out of his jurisdiction. So he started terrorizing us even more. He started backing up real fast and then pulling forward real fast and stop, and it's barely almost stopping and, and slowing down right before he would hit us within inches of our bumper. And he kept riding my tail like that the whole way and scaring us. And then my reaction to that was to take my foot off the gas and let the car slow down naturally. And that's when he pulled me over. And then gave me another falsified charge of driving too slow or rather impeding traffic. And he told me when he pulled me over, every time I see you, I am going to arrest you. Do you remember that, hon? Yeah. You saw that, right? Yeah. My wife saw it as well, right? Yeah, I saw it. And uh, my wife saw it as well. Yeah, and uh, what's that? When we took in front, it bumped the bump. It's like the, it's really, really close. Yeah, and you heard what he said to me though, right? Yeah. When, when, when he pulled us over? Yes. But he said, every time I see you, I'm going to arrest you. And the, every other day after that, there were multiple other days after that, I would, I would, when I was getting up to take my wife to her appointment, I would go out there and check to see if he was parked up there again. It was only like two or 300 meters away from the house. And sure enough, he'd be parked out there again, waiting for us to leave again. I would look out there and I observed another Harnett County pa Patrol deputy car parked up there. More than likely, it was him doing it every time because I know for sure it was him the first time on November 11th. And there was multiple days he would do that, and there was, and then we couldn't even leave the house for a while. It was a lot like being pinned down by a sniper. We couldn't leave. If we tried to move anywhere, he would get us. So what we finally had to do, I finally said, I had to have to get you to your doctor's appointments. And then we, we were, I was getting out of the military at the time, so we decided as soon as you finish your doctor's appointments, we're going to go about our move like we've been planning since before the incident happened, which we did. But the, in order to get her to her doctor's appointments, I had to drive way out of the way. We would have to get up like three or four o'clock in the morning and take a right down Highway 24 and, and go west instead of east, and then take a left on Marks Road and drive all the back roads. And from Marks Road to Long Street, cut across Fort Bragg, just to get to her doctor's appointments at Cape Fear Valley Hospital and, and avoid Deputy Nicholas Kihagas. And then that went on like that between the months of November to the end of December of 2014. And we finally left in 2000, in, in right, after, right, before, right before New Year's of 2015 is when we finally left. And we were planning on coming over here since, you know, well, actually years before that incident happened. But we were already in the process of moving before it happened. And, and they knew that. And I think the reason why they were doing that now, I talked to Jesse Jones, I spoke with Jesse Jones yesterday about that. And, and for the, because of the falsified misdemeanor charge, I was supposed to see a Judge Faircloth in Harnett County, who apparently, according to Jesse Jones, these deputies were terrified of. And they did not want me around, they did not want my wife and I around to tell Judge Faircloth what they really did to us. So Deputy Nicholas Kihagas, probably, probably on the orders of Sheriff Wayne Coates, because it happened short, it started happening shortly after I met with him in person, face to face, in his office with Wayne Coates. Um, probably, so he probably was doing this on the direction of Wayne Coates, who was their captain, patrol 
supervisor at the time. But he ran us, Deputy Nicholas Quijegas ran us out of town because they didn't want my wife and I to be around to talk about, what they, to tell Judge Faircloth what they did to us. And they deleted my recording, but what they did not get is the partial audio recording that I had saved in voice memos, which I will briefly show you because you can hear at least a, enough on there. More than just that. The you can hear enough on this audio. I, this audio recording doesn't capture much, but it captures enough to prove that Deputy Knight lied. What you're seeing here in this picture is my old iPhone 5 voice memos app, and I'm copying the recording. You can hear enough on the audio recording to prove that Deputy Knight totally lied about what happened. Watch our uh, watch. Right here. Mark, it says Mark September 26, but that's just because of the time zone of this phone. It was actually September 25th. Okay, I'm recording what's going on right now. I've got some sheriff's deputies outside my house harassing me. I'm going to keep the recorder on so you can hear this. They're pounding on my door. Oops. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Do it again. Come on, John. Okay, I'm recording what's going on right now. I've got some sheriff's deputies outside my house harassing me. I'm going to keep the recorder on so you can hear this. They're pounding on my door, pounding on my windows violently. If you break my door, I'm going to sue you. Now you heard that part right there where you, you can hear where somebody slaps the window and yells, hey, like that. Okay, well, Deputy Knight denied all that under oath during a federal deposition and totally lied about what happened. And this proves it, that he committed perjury under, under oath in federal court. That was a federal deposition that he testified under, under oath on September 26, 2017. Hear that again. Some sheriff's deputies outside my house harassing me. I'm going to keep the recorder on so you can hear this. They're pounding on my door, pounding on my windows violently. If you break my door, I'm going to sue you. Now you can hear unintelligible sounding a little bit faintly in the background. If you keep listening, you can still faintly hear a little bit of it in the background, but like I said, sometimes it would get quiet, sometimes it would get louder. This recording only captures maybe less than a minute of it, but like I said, it does capture enough to prove that Knight lied about what happened. Break my door, I'm gonna sue you. What's going on right now? I've got some sheriff's deputies outside my house harassing me. I'm gonna keep the recorder on so you can hear this. They're pounding on my door. Pounding on my windows. I wish I had a look in the tape, actually. If you break my door, I'm gonna sue you. Now listen, thank you. Now listen here. I can't because I can't leave you here alone. See, all you hear at the end there is me, me and my wife in the background just sobbing in terror. Okay, that's not what Knight said happened. What Knight said, Knight said under oath that I was running around from room to room screaming at him. Well, you can hear on this recording that's not true, that that ain't true. Listen, you hear us both sobbing in terror. You barely hear it. Okay, at the end, you can, hear us, you can hear us sobbing in the background because we were just terrified. We were scared because of what they were doing outside. And they were being, they were, I mean, everything we said, what I described previously is exactly what they were doing. Now, in, 2000, in, in July of 2016, when the Zayton Law Firm first filed the lawsuit, this was the email that attorney Matthew Ballou sent me, the opening email, um, the, the, the initial client email, okay? It, it, it says in there that I would not be required. It says, in all likelihood, you, um, you will not, you would not be required to come back to North Carolina to appear in person. So I already know the answer to that. I don't have to be there to sue them. They can take our case without us 
being there in person. They most certainly can. Matthew Blue confirmed it in this email. Maybe, possibly, if they went to trial, but I don't even know about that even because it's a civil case. And then this, email, and then this is the second page of Matt's email, and here you can confirm right here that it did come from Matt Blue. That's his, his official email address right there, mblue at zaytonlaw.com. And additionally, you can get a, if you if you need to get in touch with Zayton Law Firm, I'll I'll tell you how, because the secretary, if you call the secretary, they usually um, she usually hangs up on me. That's why I figured out a way to get through you know without them hanging up. I figured out a way to change the uh, phone number that appears in the caller ID, so they can't do that anymore. But the phone number for Zayton Law Firm is. Um, for if you want to get a hold of the owner there, there on the, on the left, you see him on the left in the blue jacket, Mr. Robert Zitton. His phone number is 919-946-4544. And on the, in the far right there in the back is Matthew Blue. His phone number is 919-649-1687. So if you need to get a hold of them, that's how you do it. You can find their phone numbers posted uh, right here on my Facebook group or on my website as well. But and here in Matthew Ballou's email here on the second page, it says, your charges have been dismissed. There are several different ways DAs can dismiss charges. Yours have been dismissed with leave. This is a common type of dismissal, and it means that technically the DA's office can bring the charges again in the future if they so desire. And he says that he, he said in this email that he didn't think they would, but uh, after speaking with Jesse, Jesse Jones told me they would. And because of all this work I've been doing on the internet, Jesse told me that they would definitely recharge. If I, if I were to go back to Harnett County, the Harnett County DA would, and Sheriff's Office would be allowed to recharge me with the same class two mis falsified class two misdemeanors. Okay, there was the falsified misdemeanor, falsified class two misdemeanor they just made up of making harassing phone calls and resisting, as well as the traffic citation that Nicholas Kihagas gave me. But if I were to go back there, according to Jesse Jones, they could recharge me. And because I've been doing all this work online, they are angry at me. And he said they are really pissed, and they would definitely recharge me. And more than likely, what would happen is I would be um, arrested again and probably held without bail, waiting for trial for God knows how long. And if you have, and, and actually, you can talk to um, Elizabeth Longman about this, but she has stories of multiple cases of people being um, unlawfully imprisoned in the Harnett County Jail, unlawful, um, um, being detained unlawfully for up to 30 days to up to even a year waiting for trial for, for misdemeanor, just for misdemeanor charges. The Harnett County Sheriff's Office, they do that routinely. They routinely um, detain people um, unlawfully all the time. So in You've seen this video here, right? Okay. Um, if I were to go back there, and I would more than likely be probably be tortured or murdered in that jail, just because of all the work I've done online. I'd be, I would definitely be a high-profile target. I would not. My wife and I would not go back to North Carolina, anywhere in North Carolina. Um, we, we will not set, we will not go back. It's just not safe. We just, we just don't trust. We do not trust Wayne Coates or Susan Matthews at all, or the district attorney at all. Okay, we, we don't trust the Harnett County Sheriff's Office, period. And honestly, even if it was safe at this point, after what they put us through, I would not pay to travel back here ever again, to travel back to North Carolina. After what they, they, they need to dismiss the misdemeanor charges without leave and let us get on with our life. And then we need to get to work on our civil lawsuit. But I have no doubt in my mind, if I went back there, something like this would happen to me. And then I've actually called over there as an activist before and they've told me they would do something like this to me, which I'll show you next here. This is the Brandon Bethay murder video. You see what they did to him. And I, okay. Watch this full video for yourself, please. 
But this is what the Harnett County Sheriff's Office does to people routinely all the time in that jail. Uh, except in this case, I don't think they expected him to die. They just wanted to torture him. It appears, at least. Here, I'll show this briefly. But we have absolutely no trust for Wayne Coates or District Attorney Susan Matthews or anybody in Harnett County. I'm sure once Reggie Watson gets elected, those charges will be dismissed without leave because he's going to get rid of Knight anyway, and there won't be any more complainant anyway. The only complainant against me is deputy, the corrupt deputies, Deputy Knight, Kihagas, and Klingman. And it was they, which for misdemeanor charges that they made up in the first place just to cover for what they did to us. And then they ran us out of town because they didn't want us to be around to tell Judge Faircloth what they really did to us. So, hell no. Go to hell, Harnett County DA. We will not... Um, we will not go back there after what you did to us. And Harnett County Sheriff, go to hell. And go to hell. I don't have to get out. Yeah, that's what I say too. Go to hell. So yeah, they're not. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. I mean, they're they're not gonna. I'm not going to give them the opportunity to put their hands on me or my wife ever again. My wife is still severely disabled from that from her TBI as well, and she requires my you know care 24/7. So I, I'm, they're not. What, so yeah, what the, I'm not going to allow them to do that to me. If I were, if if it were just me, I probably would. But I, honestly, even if it were just me. I don't want, I, I don't think I, I, this sheriff's office, they don't get to touch me ever again after that. Okay, they victimized us. You don't get to put me on trial for your falsified charges that you made up in the process just to cover for what you did. But honestly, I would have been there. I would have been in court if Nicholas Kiegas had not ran us out of town. And I know now, after speaking with Jesse Jones yesterday, why they did that, though. Because they didn't want me to be around to tell Judge Faircloth what, what they really did to us. But this is that's why we will not go back to Harnett County. Because the Harnett County Sheriff and District Attorney absolutely cannot be trusted. And they, they routinely have people unlawfully detained without bail in the Harnett County Jail all the time. For 30 days, and I've heard up to even a year, even for misdemeanors waiting for trial. And I already know what they did to me the first time. And they told me why they jacked up my bail to fifteen thousand dollars, in hopes that I would be in there long enough for my bruises to heal and not be able to document what they did. So I already know they did that. You really think I'm going to trust them again? <laughs> you really think I'm going to trust them again? Go to hell, Wayne Coates, and Harnett County DA as well. Um, that's pretty much our full story. Did I leave, did I leave anything out, hon? Yeah. Did I forget anything? I don't believe I did. And, I've, and, if, and if I did, I'm, I'm just summarizing. You can watch the uh, testimonial video that I was just showing. The 57-minute testimonial video here. Um, that my wife and I did on January 23rd, 2022. Please watch this full video minute. here. And we tell the whole story in detail, and I definitely did not leave anything out in this video if I did in this one. But I, I'm pretty sure I just about covered everything. Um, but for my next task, um, the next thing I got to do, I, I don't think I'm going to do, I don't think I need to do another video for a while. I, I would like to do another video, a positive message maybe for Reggie Watson when he releases one, maybe talking about the changes he's going to make. And I'd like to recopy that video for my, for my channel as well. Eventually, but for my next task, I'm going to finish. I need to finish reading the, the federal deposition transcripts that I was talking about for Deputy John C. Knight. I already have Knights. I, I've already read all the way through most of it, but I haven't been able to finish it yet just because it's annoying to read it because he lies so much and it's just hard to read. So I got to finish reading Deputy Knights. I need to read the transcript for Sheriff Larry Rollins. Gary McNeil, and then I will eventually create additional hyperlinks for those as well. I have already created hyperlinks for the federal transcripts for Detective Teasley, 
for John Clark, the murderer of Brandon Bethay, and Detective Toller, the one that wrote the false official statement about the Brandon Bethay murder video. And I already have hyperlinks for those posted on my Facebook group and, and posted on my website on the third post, or technically the fifth post of my website, titled um, Taser Test Screenshots and I think it's Federal Deposition Transcripts, I think it's titled, but it's the third, the third post below the, fifth, the first opening post, and or actually the fifth post below the first post that shows Reggie Watson. But it's pretty easy to figure out once you, once you uh, go to my link. It's not hard, to, it's not hard, it's real, everything's real easy to, to find on my website for the most part, for the most part. All the, um, the biggest stories are the easiest ones to find. And there's others posted on there as well, such as Kevin McWhitney from 2018. That's, that's a little further down on my website, but that was, that was another death in the Harnett County Jail. And it was ruled as a suicide, but to this day there was no camp video footage because ever since this happened, ever since the Brandon Bethay murder video happened here, here it gets down here, the, the good one. The good version of it is the one I copied on the computer, not this one, this one here. Yeah, ever since this video came out, the heart, the um, they they often they turn the cameras off in the jail, or the, if they do get the video back, it's altered or edited. For example, Angela Scarborough's case, when she was assaulted by Corporal Dawson, they edited out the video of the assault, and that's obstruction of justice. And that's just uh, yet another example. But I have uh, multiple videos posted on here as well uh, from Angela Scarborough talking about that, and as well as Elizabeth and Alan Longman, where they even go to Wayne Coates' office and talk to him about it, and he gives more BS excuses. But, you know, I remember when I was recopying that video, it just made me so mad watching it. I actually called the Harnett County Jail to ask them about it and, the, and to tell them, hey, treat the prisoners better than that and don't treat the inmates better than that and don't let anything like that happen again. And you know what I, what I got told in return? You know, this, this is what they told me in return. All I was doing, I was like... Hey, you know, just don't let that happen again. That's pretty bad. And this was the answer I got in return, which I will show you here. As soon as I get to that. Is this the one? Yes. We're going to put you in that same bad cell when we get you. Oh, really? You're going to put me in that same? Yeah, this is the one here. When I called over, this is the Harnett County Jail at 910-893-893. 0257. I called over there that day to say, hey, I was recopying this Brandon Bethay murder video, and would you guys please treat the inmates better than that and don't let anything like that happen again? You know, that's why I was calling over there for that, you know, for, to let them know that. And this is what one of the guards who answered the phone told me. And this guy had, a, was this particular guard here was saying all kinds of crazy stuff that I still have recorded. He used the name, he used, uh, uh, and the, the nickname on the phone, he said his name. I asked him what his name was, and he said that his name was Wang Hung Lo. That's what he said. But this is what he said to me on the phone, right here. Yes, we're going to put you in that same padded cell when we get you. Oh, really? You're going to in the same padded cell when we get you. So you really think I'm going to I'm going to go back to Harnett County and trust them again? I mean, it's not a it just all it is is just a class two misdemeanor that they made up and a traffic citation. Okay, it's, and, and it's just, and it was what they made up. It was a low-level misdemeanor and a traffic citation. You, but you really think I'm going to trust them ever again? They need to dismiss our case. The, the Harnett County District Attorney needs to dismiss our case without leave and let us get on with our lives because your deputies victimized us, Susan Ma DA Susan Matthews. District Attorney Susan Matthews was elected in 2020, but don't let her that fool you, though, because she's been there as an assistant DA she worked directly for Vernon Stewart for 13 years before she was elected Harnett County DA. For example, through your personal relationship, check this out here. Okay. There on the left, that's, that's former District Attorney Vernon Stewart and his wife, Karen Stewart, who was actually a district court judge in the same courtroom. <laughs> so it, I don't know how that's not a conflict of interest. And I don't know if, she, it, it, even if she's still there, it's still bias. And that's Susan Matthews there. And we, let me get to the part where they put their, bring their, pick their heads up here so you can see their faces. At least here. There you go. Okay, that's Judge Karen Stewart, former DA Vernon Stewart. And that's District Attorney Susan Matthews at her swearing in ceremony. 
And um, she was, Vernon Stewart was her boss for 13 years when she worked there as an assistant DA before getting elected in 2020. So as far as I, she is just as bad and just as corrupt as Vernon Stewart because all she is doing is, is she is carrying on his corrupt policies the same way Sheriff Wayne Coates is carrying on the same corrupt and violent abusive pra practices of Sheriff, of former Sheriff Larry Rollins. So please vote out Sheriff Wayne Coates in November. Vote for, um, vote for Reggie Watson for Harnett County Sheriff. And also vote out Susan Matthews in 2024 as well. We'll get to her. And also, going back to Nick, Deputy Nicholas Quijegas, um, about a year after our incident, in November 2015, is when he murdered John Livingston. And John Livingston was unarmed in his house. He barged into his house um, just simply because he was trying to show him like he was, that he could, the one that did that though. because he was going to, same kind of reasons why they came in our house, just to show them that they could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And then at, shortly after the John Livingston murder, he was forced to resign from the Harnett County Sheriff's Office. However, they allowed him to keep his certification and he was rehired by the Pender County Sheriff's Office in, 2000, in April of 2019. So also vote out Sheriff Alan Cutler in Pender County as well. Um, vote for either Mike Korn or Randy Burton, who uh, they're both Republicans, but they have told me that they would, um, if they're elected, they will fire Nicholas Kihakis, as well as multiple other problem deputies in Pender County as well, according to them. But I will, if there are any Democrats running in Pender County, please vote for them instead. Okay, if, if there's a Democrat running that I don't know about yet, vote for the Democrat, forget Mike Korn and Randy Burton. But if they're, the, if they're the only ones, it's either Mike Korn or Randy Burton. And I still need to check back. And another task I need to do, as well as those transcripts, I still need to look back in with the election office in Pender County and see if they did, if any Democrats did submit paperwork. But in Harnett County, it's easy. Just vote for Reggie Watson for Harnett County Sheriff. In Pender County, the options might be a little more limited. But according to the two Republicans running, uh, Randy Burton and... Mike Korn, they said they would fire Kihagas and multiple other problem deputies in Pender County if they are elected. So that'll be my next task is to check with that election office in Pender County as well. And then I still need to finish reading the transcripts for Deputy Knight, Rollins, and Gary McNeil, and I'll create hyperlinks for those as well. And then, I'll, and then I will post those on my website and Facebook group as well as soon as I get, in, get them done. But that pretty much concludes the video here. I've been working on this project now since 2020, and I, I've come a long way since I started this project, actually. I learned a lot about myself, even. I'm part, I recently discovered that I have Asperger's syndrome. It, I, I'm, I am autistic, severely autistic, and I, I even have stemming issues, and I've always had that in all my life. And it was just misdiagnosed when I was a very young child. I remember when I was very young, they were, they were taking me to multiple doctors trying to figure out what it was, and... I remember there was one doctor that even said he knew what it was, but he said if I diagnosed him with autism, he can't be in the military or something like that. I remember, I remember that now when I was very young, like six years old. Um, yes, it's, you know, it was, it was, long story short, it was misdiagnosed when I was a kid. And I recently figured out that that's what it is. That's what I have, is Asperger's syndrome. And one of the ways I learned that was by doing these videos, actually, and watching myself on video. And then there's other ways I learned as well. And then I even, I don't have an official diagnosis yet. And I don't know if I really need one or not. I'm a disabled veteran. Um, I'm re medically retired after 18 years of service. But um, yeah, so I, don't, I mean, I, oh yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I don't have an official diagnosis, but I did participate in an online study um, with, these, with some therapists in the, in the United Kingdom. And it was, like, it was a very extensive online study. It took like, in, in fact, I still need to finish doing it, but um, it took, I was work, been working on it for like eight weeks, actually. And it requires a lot of, a lot of writing and a lot of stuff. And they, it's definitely confirmed. That is, I am definitely autistic. That is definitely very much confirmed. I know it for a fact. That's why one of these days, maybe when we go back to Arizona in a couple of years where I'm from originally, I, maybe I will see a doctor and get an official diagnosis. 
We're living in Thailand for maybe a few more years because my wife's from here in Thailand and she has family. Her family lives right next door to us. You know, that's why we've been planning on coming here for so long. But we'll probably be here for a couple more years. And then the, the plan after that is to go to my hometown and maybe live in, in Arizona. I'm going to save money for a few more years and then maybe we'll buy a house in Flagstaff is what the plan. Because, you know, living here in Thailand, I can, we can save like $1,000 a month because the cost of living is so low. But, um, but yeah, I, I, one of the things I discovered about myself by doing these videos was my Asperger's syndrome. That this was one of the big, doing these videos was one of the, the big ways I, was one of the uh, biggest ways, one of the biggest factors that contributed to me learning, figuring it out. But there were other factors as well, multiple other factors as well, but this was just one of the big ones here, was doing these videos. So, you know, like I said, I've been doing this since 2020 and I've come a long way since doing it and I've gotten really good at this. And when I started out doing this, I kind of sucked at it, didn't I? <laughs> What's that? But I mean, it, it just, it took practice. Yeah, sure, here you go. Want some more of that? There you go. Some more mango smoothie I made for my wife. There you go. No problem. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so that's pretty much it. That, that's, um, that's our story. But again, for the details on our story without, where I, it, it, watch this video, that's 57 minutes long, because we don't skip anything. We, we talk about, in this video, it's, this video here is worthy of being used by attorneys is official testimony because I don't talk about any other cases in this video except for ours. I don't talk about my website or anything. And again, my website URL is Harnett County Sheriff's Office Abuse and Brutality Abuse Harnett County Sheriff's Office Abuse and Brutality Exposed US is the URL. That's also a Facebook group. I still need to update my Twitter, but you can find it pinned to my Twitter as well at, at J-O-H-N underscore G-I-L-L 1976 on Twitter. And you know what? When I create the new hyperlinks, I'll put all the hyperlinks on Twitter as well. And I'll update my Twitter as well. And I'll, I'll really, I don't really need to make any more videos for a while. So I will really get to work on my website. And I will really get to work on finishing the rest of those hyperlinks next. That will be my next task. And I will update my Twitter as well here soon as well. Within the next... I would say within the next week, I will, I will finish, or I will, in the next few days, I'll start working on the next task, on those tasks. So, thanks for watching.